So welcome, everyone. Um, Hello, everybody. Yeah, thanks for joining us to Tucson Art Academy Online Shop Talk. I think that's sort of the good title because uh, cool title. we talk shop. I hear a shop or shop. <laughs> <laughs> Do I get the shop? <laughs> you don't get the shot. You get the shop. The shot of later. Shots in the shop. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We have Simon Kogan joining us. Thank you, Simon, for uh, coming uh, on this uh, broadcast slash podcast. So if some of you are watching this, you might be watching it on YouTube. You might be watch or listening in, on a podcast. But uh, just well, I want to welcome Simon and coming on board. It's kind of neat to have this technology. So thank you, sir, for coming aboard. Can Always you, pleasure. Pleasure is all mine. Can you give a little, just a small little uh, info about you? Uh, obviously, you're a great sculptor. That's what we have you on. We, but uh, just a little, so some of the students that might be listening that are new to you, just a little back, back story. That would be great. Back story, professional artist all my life. In 91, immigrated from then Soviet Union to United States of America, since then living and working in United States. And again, doing the only thing I'm doing, the artwork, I paint, I sculpt, I, I mean, that's not because I'm so good, it's just because we're trained like dogs, we can do everything. When they say do that, you don't ask how, you just say how high you want to jump. So that's what we did. And so because of that, I'm pretty much jack of all trades when it comes to the work of art, painting in any media, sculpting in any material, bronze casting, stone carving, and so forth. So um, well-rounded education where I got from my, not just from the master's degree of the uh, university, but from, I would say the most important is from learning it from my teacher with whom I spent over 13 years, starting from cleaning the floors all the way up to the running the business. So I owe everything, all my skills and all my charm to him because he was a man of a great character, a great sense of humor, and absolutely ruthless. <laughs> Good teachers are, huh? Yeah, great teacher. He never... Uh, gave me a compliment. He never said how good I am. The only thing he was, uh, what's next? What's, uh, yeah. how good is the next one? And that's all, you know, it's all in the future. So the idea is you just grow. You don't turn back. You never look back. There's nothing there, nothing, and nobody's waiting for you. So it's all in front. So because of that great experience, I have all my skills. And, uh, from early beginning, I was teaching. That was interesting, but I always been teaching even when I was a student myself. So since those time, I've been teaching and uh, have been teaching in the United States successfully. And I do pretty much. I don't teach at any particular schools, except yours, of course. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm in like a how they call it, invited professor, lecturer, they have very funny titles, but meaning that I don't work for school, I get invited, I contract it, so I come, I do workshops, months, sometimes three months, and uh, I do that all over the world, and um, I do my private classes. So, teaching and doing art, that's all I do, that's all I am, very lucky, and never worked for anybody in my life, except that big mama art sculpture <laughs> and uh, I think that's it yeah perfect yeah you just want to um, give a little uh, backstory about you and, and and some of you some some listeners are probably uh, know all about you but it's always just fun to uh, great to hear it if you're if you're new to Simon's work and, and his teachings and I think that's that's so true of uh, really good artists that they, they, they generally do teach too. Some teach less, some teach more, but at, at some point in their journey, they, they taught. Just, I think it's a natural thing to, to do if you, if you enjoy what you do. Um, let's talk, today's topic, I want to make these uh, uh, podcasts slash video, if you're watching on YouTube here, videos uh, about particular topics 
Um, I believe that if you're listening in or watching, um, you want to take away, I want, we want you to take away something at the end and, and that you learn something from one of, one of these great uh, teachers. So I have two, uh, two images up. Let me go back and forth uh, here. And there. You can, the, can put them side by side if you need to. Yeah, let me do this. Let me do the window arrange. Doing this. Yep. There go. Yep. Yeah, so they're, they're dramatically different in, in the finish. Um, so let's talk about detail. That's the topic today. Um, can you just kind of tell us uh, about detail, good, good and bad of it? Is it needed? Is it, you know? What, what? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, detail um, is, a, I would say, is a very painful place in everybody's education because we are, as human eyes designed uh, oriented to see detail to see crisp detail i would say we're like a over sharpening tool we see extra sharp whatever we're looking at whatever is in the focus at a particular moment and we miss uh, everything else so because of that we pay i would say overly too much attention to the detail and they become more of a sickness of the work rather than a successful decoration. So from my point of view, detail is a matter of necessity. It's not a matter of because it's there. And these two sculptures are very good a choice of yours because one of them were detailed matter and one of them where detail was absolutely squeezed to the limits of it. So if we look at the image on the, I don't know, left or right, but the image, one is a falconer and the second is Abraham. So, so yeah. the, yep, the two are sculpted very differently. Uh, they are sculpted partially. It all starts with the reason. Why and what are you doing? So in one case, it was the matter of specific character it's the falconer is actually a portrait of a friend of mine a sculptor he sculpted actually the duck and the, and the bird but it's a sculpture which is the portraiture of a friend of mine or Ross Madsen who is a sculptor and a falconer but his outfit his dressing was done basically like a medieval falconer would have and because of that, it was very detailed and very specific to the timing and the description of what and how things were, were would be worn then and how they would be made and, and worn. So when the other side uh, of the Abraham, the cloth and the, I would say that the way it was, whatever he would wear didn't make many, any difference at all because it was about the mountain of a man. It was more about the power rather than, they're approximately the same size. Uh, so it's just a matter of photograph on the screen, but they're approximately the same size. So for, again, delivery reason of very detailed and crisp detail, the falconer was sculpted actually in oil clay. And uh, I think if I'm right, I don't remember, just, it's a very old piece. It may be even finished in plaster for the tightness and then remolded again. But let's, let's just forget this part. So the way the approach to the detail was, we could not, for example, the piece of the falconer could not be chased in bronze because of his uh, very, very detailed shirt. So if you look at it close, can you, uh, can, yeah. yeah, you have to do that, right? If you zoom on it, yeah, of his shirt. The shirt is made out of basically, so first I sculpted the body out of the clay, oil clay, uh, tight as I, as I needed. And then on top of that, the tracing paper was applied. So it looked like a wet cloth. Uh -huh. That's pretty clever, yeah. Yeah, thing. so because of that, it's moldable and reproducible, but you have to cast it precisely because there's no way to chase it. There's a, you cannot repair this mistake if it happened in the process. So this particular piece was casted quite a few times because we had to have a perfect casting of this sculpture. 
So, again, in this case, all the details of the shirt and all the little descriptive details of the shoes and the texture and the polish and the way it folds, all that mattered because it was a descriptive. You can see that these are leather shoes, right? And you can see that the pants are not leather because they have a different fold. So, all that is detailed as the purpose to describe what it is. Because the way the pens reflect the light is different than the, this short depend, and so forth. So every material has its own character, which means it reflects the light. That's how we see it, reflects the light differently. And for the painters, it's very clear. How do you paint the reflection of the silk? And how do you paint the reflection of the light on, on the wool? There's gonna be a very different approach because of the density of the material. So the same goes for sculpture. So in this case, again, everything is sculpted. The beard, the eyes, the fingers, the, I don't remember. I wouldn't be surprised there's the nails in there. So it's a very tight, very descriptive sculpture because, like I said, it had to have it to be recognized as something very specific. And without that, if I would put him in jeans, it would be not a medieval guy. So because of that, detail in this particular case matters. When we're looking at the piece on the left, for me on the left, I don't know, what, but for the Abraham, mm -hmm. Abraham is sculpted out of the wet clay, which is much more pliable and has a lot of character of its own. When oil clay has no character of its own. It's basically butter. But... The water clays are all of different bodies. They have grog, they have different plasticity. So I pick the particular clay for a different character. So in this case, this man was a hard man to, get, to go against, right? So all the posture, all the movement is the purpose of sculpture, how he stands, how he looks at you. All to deliver the emotional impact. So whatever would not serve that purpose as a matter of detail had to be disqualified, had to be gone. So because of that, the face is, I would say the face and the hat is suggestive detail. They are there, but they're not. They're not comparable even to the hands of the falconer, and they're not comparable to the face of the falconer because portrait of Ross is pretty much real. It's a realistic portrait of the person where the portrait of Abraham is a suggestive portrait. It's a portrait of a character or rather of a specific man. And because of that, the relationship with detail, again, is not as, is that eye looks like an atomically proper eye or it's the placement, how heavy his eyelids are, how deep is his look is, how dark because of his big forehead, this massive jaws, I mean, very, I would say, tough lips because, you know, very unhappy, big, juicy lips, and that puts mm -hmm. his um, uh, mustache and, and beard out and in front. So it's all protruding and aggressive, and at the same time, it's a lot, being small sculpture side, I think like it's like 16 inches maybe, something like that, 16, 18, between 12 and, no, it's definitely not 12, but um, something, something around 15, 16 inches. And it can be easily imagined as a huge monument. You can imagine yourself standing and being as tall as up to his knee. Yeah, and well, he can easily yeah, say. We don't know. I mean, well, unless you would have told yeah, us. Yeah, you can. If you, you can, you know, you can take a stick and just draw the line yeah. on the screen right yeah. next to him and draw the human, which is gonna uh, yeah. for uh, the the height of the person would be just up to his knee, and you will see that it's possible to have a monument of that scale, mm -hmm. and it is absolutely impossible to do that on the portrait of the. Uh, Falconer, because the amount of detail, the amount of specificity in that defines the final size of the work too. 
it is what it is. It cannot be smaller, it cannot be bigger. This is the final work. Where the other one, which is much more abstract, much more suggestive, is easily can be scaled up. I actually was planning to, had one commission, unfortunately fell through, of making this in one university and an entry piece of, I don't know, like two life sizes, huge. It would be great. But again, because of detail, a non-invasive, non-dominant, you know where the hands are. You know how the nails look like. You know how, how eyelashes look like. He doesn't need any of that. It's where things are and how they are in the character and space, but not specifically. It's like if I would give him all the fingers, all the nails on his left hand, on his, his left hand, it would not add anything to the work. It would actually be noisy and destructive. So you have to be very careful what kind of scale detail can bury, what scale of sculpture dictates how much detail it can be. It's just the same like in the painting. When you paint, a big, yeah. when you yeah. paint a big sketch, I mean like, like 16 by 8 by 18, it's not the same as you painting 6 by 8. Yeah. Where you can get away with one touch, but yeah. when you go 16 by 18, you can't just go like that. You either change the scale of the brush, or you have to paint the damn square now. Because yeah. it's now not this small, it's this big. Yeah. So it's, it's all relevant to the scale and to the purpose of the work, to the goal we pursue in delivering the message. So detail on its own is worthless. It's actually, to my, in my mind, it's negative because... It's too much of a presence, too much of a noise, too much of a dictating, describing, leaving nothing for the viewer to think about except recognizing, oh, yeah, I know it's a hand. But how do you do the hand in a way that it hasn't been done before, but it is a hand? You look at the hand of the Zorn or... It's interesting. Anytime in the in the time of painters, anybody of that time, Sergeant Zorn, Repin, uh, Serov, it doesn't matter who you pick. Fashion, when, yeah, fashion was yeah. Fan, I mean, there's a, it's a slice. Yeah. They're yeah. all paint, absolutely gorgeous hands without painting the hands. Yep. It's just it's a lot. They all come from Velasquez's hands. If you look at Alaska's hands, there's no hand, but it is a hand. Yeah. There's no description of fingers or nails or anything, but there's a hand, and it holds, it moves, it's very tight. I mean, oh, it's just, but I think this is a great example of inventing the language where necessity dictates what form the detail and shape and size and pronunciation detail would get so detail in my books does not drive i always ask a simple question and i would kind of uh, tie it up with that i always ask my students especially women do you have jewelry in your home yeah of course we have jewelry yeah, that. so do you put all the jewelry you have when you go to the party or you choose and pick oh of course i choose and pick and how long does it take yeah, it takes quite a while. Yeah, of course it does. And you end up with one right for that particular purpose, for that particular party, for that particular suit. So it's not an accident. It's chosen and picked with a reason. So that reason is necessity. That's what must be in there. Little pearl, big, like, big so casted thing. But what I mean, it is pre existing and you just have to find it and put it in the right place the same in my books is detailed in drawing and sculpture and painting yeah. it's all the same the, the, now, now just to backtrack a little bit in, in sculpture what you're saying also it does matter the material yes sir oh so versus uh i'm just saying oil painting right now i'm picking oil painting um it's oil paint there's really i mean you can put some stuff into it but for the most part it's just the paint but with sculpture, you literally have these different type of uh, 
uh, clays and what have you. So you really even have to know the material before you even begin. Because if you don't know the material, of you, course. you're not going to, yeah. The reason I'm saying this is that there's, I think there's probably plenty of students um, out there that, that, that jump to something, but they do not know the material, which is true in painting too. Uh, it could be a tool like your brush. You don't know if you push hard enough, pull all the, what that brush can do. So you have to get to know the material before you even, um, I mean, absolutely agree um, with you. And that's why I, on my books, I mean, in my classes, I constantly encourage people to try with their hands, yeah. the different materials, as many as you can. It doesn't matter what drawing, we're painting class, or sculpting class. I encourage all of them to try different clays, different yeah. charcoals, different paint brushes, different size of the actual hair different paints from oil all the way to the watercolor because mm -hmm. in order, I, I call it like a matchmaking because not everything can be sculpted, not everything can be painted. So mm -hmm. our job in my mind is to match the idea with the right form, with the right color, with the right three-dimensional. Uh, it, it, it has to find its own language. And mm -hmm. if it doesn't, it becomes another boring kits and asses, you know, just another boring photographic like we, reproduction. Which is important in the beginning. You have to, yeah, yeah, you have to know the taste so, of it. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this, uh, of course, you learn how to uh, crawl first before you walk kind of thing, too. So it, it does have its place, that boring stuff in the beginning. Oh, yeah, it's a must, but yeah. it's a must but, on the map. Yeah. It has to be wanted. You have to want yeah. to know how the hand is operating, what it is made out of and why it does what it does, yeah. rather than just simply copying the way the hand looks. Yeah. That's a yeah. big difference. Yeah. When you draw to own to understand, or you just draw to reproduce. Uh, to me, this is to and this is what you cover in your class, in the online class. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the yeah, the idea behind is that after you learn with us, you are free. You can do it on your own. Yeah, you don't depend on everyday teacher. You can take this and go further. You're welcome to come back and ask the question, but you are given the tools to grow independently. Yeah. And it's, it's extremely important from my point of view and from yours. I think it's, it's extremely, extremely important and very valuable. Yeah. Actually, while we're on this topic too, how, how do you see the, because uh, online learning is somewhat new, um, I think to uh, a lot of, to, to a lot of our students, and um, what um, advantage, not advantage, but what do you see um, in online learning that's really not possible um, in a physical workshop? Over to, Continuous you, returning to the issues on an expanse yeah. of time. Because yeah. when we're in a class, this is all you got. Three days, two days, five days, two yeah. weeks. That's it. Yeah. That's normal standard procedure uh, workshop, right? When you are in the online course, let's say an hour 365 course, it's a whole year. You can go back and forth anytime. You have, I mean, it's ridiculous even to say it, but for this little amount of money, you have... 365 days of access to a living artist, to a living teacher who yeah. you have decided to learn from. Yeah. Even I didn't have it when I worked for my teacher. Like, Imagine that. Imagine. that. Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> you have what you get, a little time. Yeah. But here, yeah. I, and I, I really enjoy uh, the, the pushy students who yeah. actually continuously coming back with the questions. Yeah. Uh, I have few of those who are just unbelievable. You tell them, this is what I think it is, and boom, like in the same day, <laughs> it already comes back with the result and asks, okay, what's wrong with that? Why this, uh, this work doesn't work? And I have no problem responding to it right away if I have time yeah. and I'm yeah. available. I just, I don't 
you know, collect that and keep it back for yeah. until the, and we can't. If I have time, I respond right away. So it does not accumulate. Yeah. And it's, it's very... The, the reason they the reason wouldn't I'm, ask, I would I'm know asking, what to do. And the reason I'm asking this because uh, you've been teaching physical classes for so long, right? Yeah. And, and this whole online thing came along, so you can compare. You have you have the ability to compare now, and uh, it, it, it's just so important to understand if, if if you guys are listening right now, what Simon is coming from, you know, so many years of physical classes, and all of a sudden this online. Uh, class that we have for him came about. So that's why I'm not trying to per se market this, but I just really want to, I'm so excited when I, when I watch your material, you know, we work together to put this together that the, the, the possibility uh, with, 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 with coming to someone for full year versus just four days. I think that's, that's the big thing. And that's what they used to do is for years and years, you study with someone, but it, with this fast paced world now, we, you know, we lost that, but I think with online, we can kind of someone bring it back. And I don't want to spend too much time on this. No, it's, it's kinda, important because yeah. there's a continuity to that, which you don't yeah. have in a limited amount of class. When you have the, let's say an issue after a, there's a ton of material to look through. Yeah. Just ton. Second, even if you have your own work in the process, you do something, and then there is a progress which can be uh, looked up on and edited. So yeah. people grow through yeah. the time yeah. with the work. And the questions, they wouldn't even have an opportunity to ask because they're not there yet yes. in their living class. When here, they came from the show, they looked at something, and then there is a conflict in their mind, and they can just spit it out and say, okay, you taught me all this, 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 but then I went to the museum and look, look at this. And Again, so there is an enormous opportunity of continuation, of questioning, of everything you accumulate. All this, those questions would not even appear yeah. in the life class because they just don't have that expense of time where you can get to this point. So yeah. for me, this is just great opportunity plus, you know, it's any time you want. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's a, um, no, it is. It's, it's a brilliant form, plus all the new tools which are available now. Yes. And this, coming, yeah, still yeah. new stuff coming aboard all You the, can look at the computer screen, and the things become alive. You can turn them, then you can cut them. And I mean, just, oh, I, I, I really love that. There's nothing yeah. I can say against this. Nothing. I yeah. just absolutely love that. I yeah. wish we can do more of this. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing. I'm amazed uh, with with it too. Um, getting back to detail, uh, would you say um, at some level it's it's definitely uh, meaning there is no right and wrong in the sense of if if you're a sculptor that paints more detailed or more loose, right? And, um, as long as the fundamentals are there, is that is that true? I don't know. I have trouble with fundamentals lately because um, fundamentals takes a lot of time to collect, to learn, yeah. and to use in order for them to become yours so you can kind of, let's say, forget them. I encourage people with the base we provide them to still stay themselves. Yeah. and learn to appreciate and see what they are actually seeing themselves and executing themselves. So I would be, I'm much more concerned about personality of a student than their technical side. Because for the ability of being technically proper, they don't need me. They don't need you, they don't need anybody. You get your chair, you get your model, you sit and you work, you draw. You sculpt, you paint, whatever. It's hours of learning. And for that, we can just guide. That's it. That we cannot walk the walk for them. But when they come to us with their personal desire of doing something, and we can guide them in the direction of their own development on the base which is given in that course, 
They can always go look like an encyclopedia, like a library. They can always look, okay, how do you do the eye? Okay, this is what an eye is. Okay. Today, you don't do eyes. Today, you do the landscape. You don't care about the eyes. Why do you need to learn how to draw the eye? I approach this knowledge in the age of adulthood as, a, again, as a necessity. When you need to know how to do it, you will learn the detail, the structure, the character. And when you learn it, you'll learn it forever. But if you learn it, whatever I think you need without you being involved, then it's, it's, it's a useless knowledge. You forget about it. You know, it's like, psh. when we were learning anatomy, we had to learn all the Latin name of the word, all the mechanics of it. Do you think I remember one? <laughs> no, no. Not one. Maximum glutinous. I, I remember one. <laughs> Maximus. That's a good name. <laughs> yeah. And you know where it is, right? <laughs> but that's it. I don't remember what it does. I don't remember. And I don't care. So detail is a matter of necessity. The basic knowledge is a matter of necessity. It's you. I don't. Why would I turn somebody into a copy of anybody, me? It's impossible. I can only share the approach. And then people take it as a tool. You know, it's like a car. I give them the car. Do two people drive the same? No. That's why there are races. They're all racing the same cars, and they all drive them differently. So the knowledge is all available to them. How and what they do with that, it's a matter of personality. And to me, that is golden. And that's what I try to make them believe that that is true. And if you are honestly working in that direction without being concerned about somebody's looking at you from behind and you have to show it to Simon or to Gabor and make sure that they're happy and you're just doing it for your own happiness, it provides you with honesty which is unmatched. You can't, nobody can do it as somebody does it for himself, honestly, with his own pleasure. And all the knowledge, all the learning, all the continuous work is driven in that direction to be honest and only what you need. Just, it's like cooking the soup. Do you put all the spices you have in there? No, mm -hmm. only what's needed. And then you taste and you let it boil down. And it's like, it's a process. But again, is there two soups the same? No. no. Same goes for, for us and for what we do. Yeah. So yeah. to me, learning must be driven. There is no learning. At school, they teach children the way they teach because they need them to learn how to work. That's why they sit and they draw the squares and rectangulars and conus and, you know, all those plasters. It's a... It's a, teaching, it's a teaching of discipline and mechanical skill. Mechanics. So the, you hold the pencil right, you don't do that, you hold the whole arm, you know, all that mechanics of how to work so you can actually work for 24 hours standing. Because if you don't stand right, you don't hold tool right, your neck hurts, your arm hurts, and so forth. So all that is taught in the beginning for the kids. The rest of the work is they teach them that it's not a joke, and that's why they sit and they draw for hours. There's no reason for me to make my adult students to sit and listen to me. They know what they came for. And that's the beauty of this. Yeah. There is a knowledge. You do whatever you want with that. Whatever time takes, as long as it takes, whenever it takes, it's, it's just gorgeous. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I don't know how to say how, how great that is. So that's my, my, the way I look at these things. Yeah. So I remember in China when I was teaching, one kid came up and said, sir, what's more important, soul or skill? I would say so all the time. Of course, of course. But mm -hmm. the question itself, I never heard that. I mean, I teach for, I don't know, 40 years. Nobody ever asked me that. 
But the fact is very important because in China, traditional school, you know, skill is important. And that skill is built in a lot of repetition and a copying. So it's a very specific, it's, even, it's a very different from even, uh, let's say, Russian school or Italian school. It's repetitive, but it's repetitive on the copying the master, this, the hand of the master. So it, it's, it's, it's different. Yeah. But they're getting sick of it too. So they, they start questioning, is that the right form and how do they do that? But what's important for me in this question is that, again, the skill should be driven. The obtaining of the skill should be driven by the soul. I need to know how to draw that hand. I need to know how to sculpt that bird. I need to know how this old man, why he's pulling the leg. Because the angel broke his hip. Yeah. That's why he's pulling the leg. So that's why Abraham is like kind of like pulling the leg. Why? Because it happens. Yeah. That's why I'm saying, I, sculpt, I call him Abraham, but I think I sculpted Jacob. Okay. Because Jacob forced, uh, fought the angel, right? Yes. Yeah. So, but the idea behind I thought that's fine. It doesn't matter. What matters is that it brought that physicality to the work. And that's what you, and again, how much anatomy and reality is in there? Not much. But it's all based on the structural details, where they are, how they are. And again, yeah. they're not descriptive. They're all suggestive. So again, it's a designing of the language for a specific detail to appear. And your job is to formulate that, to find it. So, so detail actually, uh, uh, to an untrained eye, uh, some people can get away uh, with that, but, but a more skilled uh, critic or, or, or an artist will see that they're trying to hide a bad, uh, their hide. craft is not up, up to uh, a certain level. I'm going to call you if you're going to hide. You know me. <laughs> yeah, so that's the same thing with painting. People think it's loosey-goosey that it's a, it's a lack of it, – it's, there's a misunderstanding. I think Sandy Scott said that it's not – loose is not the way it's done. I don't know, did she say that? Loose is not the way it's done and how it looks. Yeah. And uh, nice. I think it's – Nice. Good saying. Um, <laughs> I have to steal that one. Yeah, that's from it's not Sandy the way it looks. Yeah, Sandy's a good <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, so that's that's so true. So if you look at the uh, this loose work, Abraham or Jacob, um, it uh, there's so much knowledge under the hood. Even though it's loose, there's there's so much knowledge under under you know. I remember what to yeah. illustrate that when I was teaching at, in China, my professor colleague, the dean of art department, was present when I was sculpting, and he called up the attention of the old students and said. Please pay attention closely. His moves are elusively simple. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's a that's a great trait of a a really good artist, musician, writer. All these things. It's it looks looks easy. They make it yeah, look it looks simple it look and easy. easy. Yeah. And, um, then, and then another great example. There is a great Chinese um, a potter. He's like a national treasure of the uh, Hunan. He restored a lot of Tang Dynasty uh, glazes and pottery. So he's a very tiny little man, just charming, beautiful. So I was there visiting him, and I wanted to. I said, "Let me sculpt you. Can I?" Because he gave me a couple pieces of his, and I felt kind of, so. I'm sculpting his head, not big head, you know, half life size. And I think I did three trials. I destroyed one, I destroyed two, I'm making the third one. And he's, you know, he's an older man. He, he's good for me like a father. And he sits and waits and models for me. And then I kind of apologetic, I'm saying to him, sir, I'm sorry for taking so much time, but I'm trying to be as simple as you are. I mean, as, as you work. Yeah. And he kind of shakes his head and, and he says, I know it's hard. <laughs> and he's, you know, he's like a little simple ceramic. I mean, just every day you, you use them, throw away, right? And it looks so charming, so beautiful. <laughs> simple, right? 
<laughs> yeah, after 80 years of doing it, maybe soon. <laughs> yeah, it's like, actually, my, I was talking with my mom and she was making some kind of just, uh, oh, it was a, it was a pastry, sh uh, the shell, you put something in it and she goes, it's so simple. You just put, it's eggs, flour, it's egg, eggs, flour and sugar. Yeah. <laughs> and I go, yeah, but mom, you've been making it for 50 years. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, simple. <laughs> yeah, so there, there's time that you need to spend with any craft. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah. my recommendation is very specific. Is It's not just a time spent. It's a time directed to search of finding a specific yeah. needed skill. Yeah. Every yeah. detail is a, only one form for one case. Yeah. Every finger, it, it, it always has to be just the right decision, just the right form, just the right color. It's like Cezanne said, right? What's a painting? It's the right color in the right place. It's easy. Yes. <laughs> Simple as that. Any final words uh, about detail that maybe you haven't uh, touched on? Anything you want to wrap up? Details are expensive. They are not easy to pick up and carry. So it's not about how... If you, I strongly recommend to look for the painters on Velasquez's big portraits of Isabella's with all the decoration, there's all this jewelry on her but close up on the jewelry. It blows you away. It's like 21st, 24th century. It's absolutely abstract. There is no description of what soever. And we're talking about 17th century. So it's not about how precisely you can describe. It's what you can see and what you can pull out of it for the purpose of your own work. Because everybody, I mean, you can't compete today with a camera. The phone does better photograph than you ever can draw or see. So our job is to do what any machine cannot. Because it doesn't suffer like we do. It doesn't have moods as we do. It sees what it sees. We have sensations. We have emotions. And everything should be emotionally charged. That's great. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Simon, for uh, joining thank us. You, man. Yeah, really, really appreciate it. If you're <laughs> watching this on YouTube, please give us give us a like, a share, subscribe to our 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 channel. That would be excellent. If you're watching this or listening somewhere else, that would be also great. Um, share it with your art friends. That's the idea here: is to share this knowledge that uh, all these great artists uh, have. And uh, so, thank you again. Thank you, man. Yeah. Let's do more of this, more specifics. I love that. <laughs> All right. Great. Thanks, Simon. Thank we'll you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.